Thank you all for coming and welcome to the Heritage Foundation and to our Lehrman Auditorium. Um, I'll just ask you before we get started to please make sure your cell phones are turned off or silent or non-vibrating or otherwise uh, non-interrupting. And actually, could someone get that? It looks like they are locked out. I could see the, the door was trying to be open, but there we go. Thank you. So as of last week, six states and the District of Columbia have enacted laws allowing for physician-assisted suicide. Uh, and at the end of last week, the Maryland House of Delegates voted uh, to allow it. This, that now goes to the state Senate, and then we'll see what happens uh, with the governor. Although it is sometimes proposed as a relief for patients undergoing pain and suffering, physician-assisted suicide contributes a major, constitute, constitutes a major break with the traditional medical ethics embodied in the Hippocratic Oath that call on doctors to heal patients. Many analysts across the ideological ideological spectrum agree that the normalization of medical killing poses a threat to the poor, the disabled, and vulnerable members of society. Uh, several years ago, I wrote a report uh, here for the Heritage Foundation titled, Always Care, Never Kill, How Physician-Assisted Suicide Endangers the Weak, Corrupts Medicine, Compromises the Family, and Violates Human Dignity and Equality. Now my colleague, Bob Moffitt, has taken the next step uh, from uh, uh, simply saying that physician uh, assisted suicide isn't the answer, to taking that next, next step to saying what is uh, the answer and what policymakers can do as an alternative uh, to physician assisted suicide. And so we're gathered today uh, with an expert panel to discuss his new report uh, available at the door. So if you didn't get a copy as you come, came in, make sure to get a copy as you leave. Bob's report is titled End of Life Care Expanding Patient Choice of Ethical Options. And so joining us today to discuss Bob's paper and to discuss ethical choices at the end of life are Professor Far Curlin, a medical doctor. He's a professor of medical humanities at Duke University and at the School of Medicine and the School of Divinity there. At Duke, Far practices palliative medicine, uh, so the uh, treatment of pain, uh, particularly at the end of life. His research focuses on patient-doctor relationship, uh, the moral and professional formation of physicians, and the practices of care for patients at the end of life. Uh, next up, we'll hear from Dr. Kevin Donovan. Kevin is the director of the Center for Clinical Bioethics and a professor of pediatrics at Georgetown University's Medical Center. Dr. Don Donovan was the founding director of the Oklahoma Bioethics Center and has three decades of experience in clinical bioethics and, the clinical, and clinical medicine, being recognized as one of America's, quote, best doctors. He has served on multiple ethics committees for hospitals and national organizations, as well as chairing institutional review boards. And then finally, we'll hear from uh, my colleague, Bob, uh, Dr. Robert Moffitt, uh, PhD, not MD. Go to him with metaphysical problems, not physical problems. <laughs> he's a senior fellow here at the Heritage Foundation, and he's the former chairman of the Maryland Health Care Commission. Uh, Bob has uh, long specialized in health care and entitlement programs, especially Medicare. Uh, he brings to the health reform effort his government experience as a principal deputy assistant secretary at the US Department of Health and Human Services and as a senior official in the Office of Personal Management, where he served during the Reagan administration. In 2010, Modern Healthcare Magazine named Bob one of the 100 most influential Americans in healthcare, and he has testified frequently before various congressional committees. So please join me in welcoming today's panel. It's, thank you, Ryan. It, it seems to me that this, um, growth in advocacy for physician-assisted death uh, brings uh, into the light the fact that medicine is at a, a watershed moment. We're at a crucial point, it seems to me, in the history of the profession at which we're going to have to make a decision and the public will have to make a decision about the profession of medicine regarding whether we will be a profession of healers who commit to acting only in a way that is consistent with the patient's health, or whether we're going to be reduced to a so-called profession of providers who are willing to make available any intervention that the law will permit, even if that intervention directly contradicts the patient's health. For more than 2,000 years since the Hippocratic Reform Movement, Physicians in the West have maintained a firm commitment 
to care for those who are sick, not respecting their other characteristics, seeking to preserve and restore their health. And to sustain that commitment, and as an outgrowth of that commitment, doctors have recognized that there are some things a physician must never do. Chiefly, they, they must never kill or intentionally damage or destroy a patient's health. Now, does that mean doctors ignore suffering? Of course not. As Ryan said, I practice palliative medicine. My regular clinical practice is caring for those who are suffering pain and breathlessness and any number of other difficult symptoms that often accompany advanced illness. And I can tell you that we now have uh, measures to effectively treat pain, breathlessness, and other difficult symptoms more than we have ever had before. And we can do that while respecting ethical guidelines that have guided the profession of medicine for centuries. Again, chief among those guidelines is that a physician would never intentionally cause or hasten a patient's death. And the moves for assisted suicide, I think, highlight uh, the way that this issue um, is consequential for the question of solidarity and trust. I have met many patients who are wary of and even firmly resistant to palliative medicine or hospice. Patients on the south side of Chicago, patients in Durham, North Carolina. And they are resistant and wary because they're worried that doctors today are falling prey to a temptation to get rid of suffering by getting, getting rid of the one who suffers. This is not a new temptation. It, this is endemic to or always been part of the practice of medicine and caring for those who are grievously ill. And it's because of this enduring temptation that doctors have committed themselves for centuries uh, as in the Hippocratic Oath where it states, I will neither give a deadly drug to anybody who asks for it, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. Or in the AMA's codes, uh, where it has a main, ma the AMA has maintained since its founding that physician-assisted suicide is fundamentally inconsistent with the physician's professional role. In the World Medical Association, which has opposed assisted suicide and euthanasia since it was formed and issued the Declaration of Geneva just after the Second World War. This is consistent across the profession in the West for all of these centuries. And the commitment to never kill creates a boundary within which patients can entrust themselves to physicians' care when they are too sick to care for themselves. And crucially important, it gives physicians the freedom to treat patients' symptoms decisively and effectively, accepting the side effects of such treatment when there's good reason to do so, when there's proportionate reason to accept those side effects. So while advocates for physician-assisted suicide say that it is needed to relieve suffering, in fact, the practice of assisted suicide makes it harder to relieve suffering. I will tell you it has already made it more difficult for me to relieve the suffering uh, of patients because it erodes the trust that patients must be able to place in their physicians in order for physicians to effectively treat their pain and other symptoms. So I want to say this again. Physicians cannot practice causing the death of their patients without undermining the trust on which the practice of medicine depends. And because of that, I would encourage the public to ask their physicians a question that probably the public thought they could take for granted. Um, but ask them, are you a physician who is willing to kill? Or are you a physician who is committed only to heal? Um, the notion that we can have these two things together is, uh, is, is a mistake. Uh, we're either going to have one or the other. 
And I hope that we will uh, form sufficient resistance within the profession and the without so that we preserve a profession that patients can trust uh, when they are gravely ill and when they need someone to care for them without worrying that they might uh, be willing to end their life in order to end their suffering. Well, it may not surprise anyone, but uh, I actually agree with Dr. Curlin. Uh, quite frankly, the, uh, the onset of uh, physician-assisted suicide uh, entering into our culture and Western culture in general uh, just scares the heck out of me, primarily for the patients involved, but as he said, also for the profession. Uh, quite frankly, people will say, well, why don't you just let those who want this pursue it and the rest of you just stay out of it? Uh, but when the rest of you includes those practicing physicians who have no interest in, in pursuing this, uh, think it's bad for their patients, what we're finding out is that... Uh, that they are being frequently not only encouraged, but even required in some venues to, uh, to participate or refer these patients to one who wants to participate in assisting in their suicide or in euthanasia where that's legal. And I find this quite disturbing. Whatever is permissible in medicine becomes habitual. Whatever is habitual becomes standard of care and then what is standard of care becomes required. And this is where we are. We're on the threshold of that right now in this country as they are in others. Now, you'll notice in this discussion today, I think you will hear no religious arguments uh, because they're not really required to highlight the concerns here. Uh, nevertheless, some might be wary of presenting themselves to their, un to their creator unbidden following an action that's harmful to themselves and others. The question then is, is it harmful? You know, and yes, harm is involved. Harm is involved clearly, I think, when someone kills themselves, no matter what their motivation. I also think that uh, it's arguably not just the patient involved who commits suicide, but also those who have no interest in it except the harm done to society. I don't think this is a victimless crime any more than others described as such, like prostitution. Uh, that's perhaps the only connection between the two, but I think it's a very serious one. Before delving more into this, I think we ought to consider, you know, and be clear, don't doctors already kill their patients? You know, you can go around to an ICU any week in any, uh, any hospital and somebody's being taken off a ventilator, you know, aren't we killing them when that happens at the end of life? Is there a difference uh, between stopping those treatments and, and just doing it in another way? Is withholding and, and withdrawing therapy, are those different or are they the same? So let's, let's think about that. The standard dictum has been that if you withhold or withdraw a life-sustaining intervention, that those are morally equivalent. And I would argue that, yes, that, that should hold in the same set of clinical circumstances. So a decision, it, although it often doesn't feel the same, a decision not to initiate a life-sustaining treatment or to initiate it, see that it doesn't seem to be beneficial anymore and to then discontinue it, should be looked at in the same moral sense. Now, that isn't to say that what we're talking about here is uh, lacking a uh, distinction between killing and letting die. There is no moral obligation to employ measures near the end of life or at any other time that offer insufficient benefit to the patient, but at the same time would have caused excessive pain uh, excessive inconvenience or even cost to the patient or to their family or even to society. Once we accept that, then we can say, well, then maybe, you know, withholding, withdrawing can be 
can be a way to deal with the issues that concern us, as long as we're not actively killing the patients. How do we know the difference? Well, one of my colleagues at the, uh, the Pellegrino Center at Georgetown came up with a formulation that I think is very helpful. And I think that when we think about it, we can distinguish killing versus letting die depending on whether or not you are introducing a new lethal state at that time, all right? Because as we've already heard from Dr. Curlin, to introduce a lethal state as a physician goes against everything that is in the traditional ethic of medicine. But if there is already a lethal state, then what you may be doing is allowing that lethal state to take its natural course. That may be a perfectly moral act. You can also envision when it may not be, but that would be in distinction to the situation in which a new lethal state is introduced, as in, say, writing a prescription for lethal medications or injecting something into their veins that would then cause their heart to stop or their breathing to stop with the intention of bringing about the end of their life. All right. These are things that we certainly find problematic in the practice of medicine. Patients feel the same way for the most part. Many patients are very afraid of uh, end-of-life treatments in part because it's been seen in the past that once you get put in the ICU and you're on a ventilator or you're on dialysis or these things, it seems to be almost like a runaway train that nobody seems to be able to stop. And you are in for a life of suffering until the moment of your death. Now, unfortunately, it, it can look that way, and sometimes it has turned out that way, but it certainly doesn't have to be that way. And one of the things that makes a difference here is the patients themselves taking steps to avoid that sort of uh, scenario. Well, how can you do that? Well, this is the place where uh, letting people know what you want and making sure they know what you don't want as well can be very useful. And the best way to do that, I think, is one form of an advanced directive. No, no advanced. Advanced directive. And there are two forms of them. One is called a living will, where you uh, stipulate all the things that you would or wouldn't want. Usually they're, unfortunately, I think put only in the negative. Um, and the other form is called a, a proxy appointment, a surrogate appointment, or the appointment of a durable power of attorney for health care. And all of those terms mean essentially the same thing, that you are picking someone to speak for you when you are unable, because of your illness, to speak for yourself. I will also admit at this point, I have a, uh, a strong preference for one or the other. As a physician, uh, I don't really get enthusiastic about living wills if they have nothing else to tell us, because they tend to be typically uh, too vague. You know, they, they tell us what people's aspirations might be, but they don't really give us enough information to make the decision about one particular patient with one particular intervention in a particular point of time in a particular illness. Now, some people have tried to overcome that aspect of them, uh, and those of you who live where there are so-called MOLST or POLST forms, these are medical orders or physician orders uh, for life-sustaining treatments. And those get very specific, particularly Maryland's form. So you will see that you know you will not only accept things like CPR at the end of life or rejected, or ventilators are rejected, but even discussion of endotracheal tubes, or if you're going to get antibiotics, should they be oral or IV? Now, when I start telling people about this, they, they start to snicker a little bit, saying, you're really telling me that patients are supposed to be deciding this for the doctors in advance? not even knowing what the situation might be. And I think that you start to see some of the problems. You don't have to be somebody working in the ICU to see how that could be problematic. But what if somebody knows exactly who you are and what you value and what you fear and might be willing to and empowered to discuss this with the power of making decisions for you? That's the, the surrogate appointment. 
That could work very well if you have a surrogate and you have told that surrogate exactly how you feel about things, then they can use those values and apply them as flexibly as necessary to that end-of-life situation. I think that that gives us a way out of the, uh, of the feeling that we have to be able to do something much more drastic near the end of life to satisfy patients' needs. I think patients need not to be overtreated. I think they need not to be kept in pain. But I think they do need to have attention put to their medical needs, their psychological needs, their spiritual needs. And these things can be handled without putting them to death. Now, what would be nice is if the policies in the United States also matched our prescriptions. So I think that it would be useful to kind of look at what we have and perhaps what we should have to make this work better. Well, thank you very much, <coughs> Dr. Donovan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the emerging uh, debates right now over the end of life care, not only in the state of Maryland, but in other legislatures, is, I think, an opportunity. It's an opportunity for policymakers and also those who are leaders of civil society, I'm talking about private institutions, religious institutions, to take some more direct action in this area that is going to preempt a lot of what is actually happening, which is to start to make decisions on a policy level that will start to redefine the debate in the right way, which is how is it that we can uh, affirm uh, the inherent dignity uh, and the value of human life how can we secure uh, the best and the most humane treatment uh, for those who are aged or frail or seriously ill until their time of natural death? Um, as I insisted, I think, most strongly, I think, in the paper that uh, you have today, uh, this is an area of public policy uh, where the role of government is actually inherently limited. Uh, this is where this is an area of, 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 of public discussion and debate where most or all of the key decisions in this area should be made uh, by individuals and families, the institutions of civil society, patients in consultation uh, with their physicians, and uh, also religious authorities, uh, especially, or members of the clergy. Um, Nevertheless, having said all of that, recognizing the fact that actually this is actually a public, uh, this is a matter for civil society, public policymakers do in fact have, I think, an opportunity to do some very positive things in this area. Dr. Donovan just mentioned uh, advanced uh, planning, advanced directives. Without specifying the content of end of life care uh, policies, uh, about the documents themselves, Policymakers can do some very positive things to encourage their adoption and use, uh, give people an opportunity to uh, authorize a person to act as their proxy, usually a friend or a family member or a trusted individual who would be given the power of attorney and empowered to make decisions uh, concerning end-of-life care for the person uh, to whom that power has been entrusted. Um, there are a lot of ways of doing this, but certainly the most important thing is to make sure that these advanced directives, uh, when they are legally drawn up, are compatible with the uh, patient's uh, moral uh, and religious and ethical convictions. So that those who are involved with the treatment of people at the end of, the li end of life will have a guidepost of exactly what is acceptable and what is not. People actually do know, we know this from survey research, most Americans frankly know that they should do some kind of planning uh, for the end of life. The reality, however, is most simply do not do it. Uh, and there's an under, I, it, you can understand that. I mean, it, it's hard to ask people to start thinking about their very, very last hours or days on Earth and, you know, start to draw up documents to that effect. I mean, there's an emotional response to that. However, um, there are ways, I think, that we can encourage this. We can encourage it. Uh, through uh, public communications. When, and I'll just give you one, one possible uh, way of doing this. Uh, for example, uh, nine out of 10 people who die in the United States die as uh, recipients or beneficiaries of the Medicare program. Uh, 
right? That makes certain. That makes sense. We all know that. Uh, when a person is newly enrolled in Medicare, uh, Washington policymakers could actually make, uh, you know, a uh, an encouragement uh, that uh, people consider uh, taking out an advanced directive. They could do that through. Uh, simple communications through the, 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 pop, the publication that every senior citizen gets called Medicare and You, which spells out what your, uh, what your benefits are and certainly what kind of options you have in Medicare, whether you want to stay in traditional Medicare or whether you want to go into Medicare Advantage. Another option would be a, a test. Uh, we have in, in, the, in the current law um, a center at the Medicare at, at, at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, an agency that does demonstrations. One thing we could try to do is to provide an economic incentive for people to voluntarily uh, take out an advanced directive, say give them a premium discount over a period of two or three years uh, for them if they were to submit an advanced directive to the Medicare program. Uh, and to their for their physician uh, held make, making of course that all of the uh, of the privacy protections are available to them uh, that could function somewhat like the kinds of um, economic incentives that exist today in private health insurance in many areas uh, of the country and certainly over in Europe where you have private health plans if pre people in, uh, engage in wellness or preventive care uh, they are actually given premium discounts. This is the same idea. Uh, I'm not saying that we should rush into this. I think this is something that you should never rush into an area like this. But I do think it would be a good idea for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation uh, to try uh, an experiment to see uh, how it works, You know, how many people would sign up, uh, what the performance would be in that area. Uh, and you know, hopefully, it would be something that uh, uh, people, would, uh, people would gravitate toward. Um, Religious institutions, and I'm talk I know there are members of clergy here, but I think this is vitally important. Advanced directives exist, but they should not necessarily be only between uh, a person and their lawyer. Uh, there's a tremendous role, it seems to me, for uh, faith-based or religious organizations, religious institutions, or churches to actually develop guidelines or templates uh, for Medicare, uh, for Medicare advanced directives, or for any other type of advanced directive, to spell out what the uh, what the ethical guidelines would be, uh, and certainly people would feel very comfortable, and because this is an area we know from survey research once again where there's an awful lot of confusion about what is appropriate, what is inappropriate. When you know, for, as Dr. Donovan pointed out, there are areas here that are not so crystal clear up front, but. Certainly, uh, some of the best thinking in this area by, uh, by religious leaders and philosophers and theologians has, can be brought to bear in helping to develop uh, these, uh, these advanced directives. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Donovan mentioned uh, palliative care. Dr. Curlin mentioned it. Palliative care is a wonderful thing. It provides relief from from pain, it pro provides comfort, provides patients with physical and, and sometimes social, uh, psycho psychosocial and spiritual uh, services. It's uh, palliative care is often curative. Hospice care is not. Uh, under Medicare law, uh, hospice care is reserved for people who have uh, a diagnosis or a prognosis of six months or less to live and then a person would be qualified for hospice care. Now, Medicare finances palliative care right now. But if you know anything about the Medicare payment system, you know that the Medicare payment system is very fragmented. It's very disjointed. Palliative care services uh, are provided under Part A, which is the hospital part of Medicare, and also Part B. The difficulty is, is that there is no, th this payment system is incompatible with the kind of team-based care which is natural. Uh, for, uh, for hospice or for palliative care. So basically, um, the Medicare program, and I'm happy to report to you that the Trump administration is right now, as we speak, considering this, putting together a new payment system for palliative care, which would basically integrate payment and the delivery of care, something like a bundled payment system uh, for people who are involved in, in palliative care. Hospice uh, is a very different uh, animal. Hospice is reserved under the Medicare program, as I said earlier, for people who have six months uh, or less uh, to live. 
And Medicare covers hospice. It is part of the Medicare program right now. It is a team-based care. It provides a wide range of continuum of services for people who are at the end, at, at the end of life. It's, a, it's, a, it's about 46% right, right now of senior citizens, the most recent data, is about 46% of senior citizens in Medicare take advantage of hospice. However, we can do better than that. We should open up the system. And I'll just mention one option that seems to me to be perfectly reasonable. We have a Medicare Advantage program, which covers over 36% right now of all people who are enrolled in Medicare. Medicare Advantage does provide palliative care, but under current law, it does not provide uh, uh, hospice care. Now, Medicare Advantage plans have actually pioneered in a very, very positive way case management and, and, and care coordination uh, in, in the, and, and, and delivered team-based care in, in a very, very effective way for people suffering from chronic illness. It would make perfect sense to allow the Medicare Advantage program to offer hospice care just like they offer palliative care and various other types of care. And finally, I'll just mention one other thing. You all know this, and those of you who follow health policy know this very, very well. We have a system where all the key decisions that are made in our system are basically made by third parties. That is to say, what kind of benefits you get, what kind of plans you get, what kind of medical treatments and procedures you get is determined either by your employer and employment-based health insurance or by uh, some government agency. So managed care executives, corporate executives, or government officials make all of these decisions. We do not have, in the United States, a consumer-friendly health insurance market. It is something that the Heritage Foundation has been banging about for 30 years. It's really time that we start thinking about this in an even broader way. It's not get simply getting the best value for money that we have to think about now, but we have to think about uh, we have to think about value in a broader sense. Are are the institutions, the insurance companies, the third-party payment arrangements, the hospital systems, and so on? Do they do they respect or accommodate? your ethical or moral or religious convictions at the end of life. Now, I have a very simple principle, and the simple principle I have, if, um, if uh, an institution or uh, plans or providers reject your values, you should have an absolute right to reject theirs and enroll in health plans and contract with providers who respect or will accommodate or promote your ethical or moral or religious convictions. Uh, for healthcare, that means some very, very big changes in the health insurance markets, such as changing the way in which the markets function, in particular, the tax treatment of health insurance to level the playing field among different types of plans. But I would offer one other suggestion, and that is that today, within the uh, consumer-based programs that do exist in the federal government. I'm thinking about uh, Medicare Advantage and the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program in particular. Uh, the administration, policymakers, ought to encourage uh, religious, faith-based organizations and churches, too, to sponsor health insurance, just like um, the unions, for example, sponsor health insurance. That is to say, have a, a whole continuum of care delivery and financing that actually recognizes and respects the fundamental values, the ethics, uh, the ethics and, the, and the moral convictions and religious convictions of people who enroll in those uh, institutions. Uh, there's a lot more to say, and I'm quite sure the question and answers uh, that we have will start to illuminate, illuminate this even further. But policy ultimately is grounded in first principles, as you know. When life begins, when life ends is a scientific question. Whether or not human life has intrinsic value is not a scientific question. It is a philosophical question and ultimately a religious question. Uh, that is an underlying uh, principle or an underlying fact of this debate. You cannot separate ethics and uh, politics. Uh, you can't do it. Um, in fact, uh, politics depends upon ethics. They are distinct but inseparable. And you can't check your moral premises at the gate of public uh, debate or the arena of public debate. Thank you very much. Great. So we have um, plenty of time for uh, 
uh, questions. Um, the floor is open. Uh, wait for the microphone to come to you. Um, Abby will be bringing that around. Uh, make sure your question ends with a question mark. <laughs> and if you can begin your question by just identifying yourself, letting us know uh, who you are and where you come from, that'll be perfect. And I saw a hand right here. Um, so the mic's coming back around. Uh, right here. Hi, I'm Father Vincent Rigdon, the Archdiocese of Washington. Uh, I am also a senior citizen, and I have just finished my welcome to Medicare visit to my physician. There is such a thing, and that's the official name that has. And uh, Dr. Moffat will be happy to know that one of the questions they ask is, "What's your end of life plan? You know, do you have do you, do you have a designated you know all these other things?" So at least it, they are they are alert, they are starting to do what you were asking them to do. They're also trying to find out if I'm depressed, also. Such as. <laughs> Anyway, just it, uh, no, no question mark, just a statement. Great, and, and just pass right in front of you. That'll be perfect. I'm Jonathan Inbody with Christian Medical Association. I wonder if you can tell us something about the trends you're seeing in the policies of medical societies and also trends in the oaths that uh, are being used in medical schools. I, I uh uh, can say a bit about that. It is the case uh, that now in the United States, virtually no medical schools um, have their students say the Hippocratic Oath in a way that includes its core moral uh, proscriptions. So the oath that's taken, for example, at Duke University has cut out the commitment to not kill and has cut out the commitment to not practice abortion. Um, and that's uh, the pattern across uh, the U.S. medical schools. I think that's deeply unfortunate, and, it's, and it shows the kind of cultural movement that has laid the groundwork for now advancing to killing patients as the next step. Um, another, one other troublesome, uh, not well, just one of the many troublesome other signs of this kind of movement is uh, the fact that the College of Physicians and Surgeons of the province of Ontario two years ago um, established a rule uh, that has the force of law that compels physicians there to um, take positive action uh, to make an effective referral, that's the language of the policy, for any legal intervention, including euthanasia. So in effect, it, the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Ontario said it is unlawful for a physician to refuse to arrange for the killing of a patient who asks for that uh, killing. And um, so the trends are not, are not good. And in addition, uh, you asked about medical societies, and unfortunately, they're following the same trend. Uh, we are seeing those faced with the moral dilemma of whether or not a physician ought to assist a patient in con committing suicide. Uh, finding no common moral ground on this. And so more often than not, they think that a, uh, a posture of neutrality somehow resolves the problem. You know, notwithstanding that uh, the legal precept is, of course, that silence gives consent. So as soon as a medical society goes neutral on something that they have opposed, they are, I think, sending a message that uh, it no longer is worthy of opposition. I would just simply uh, echo all of that. Uh, my, my reading is that um, the traditional Hippocratic Oath has actually been in decline for about two generations. And um, <clears throat> the, um, one of the reasons why I think we, we need a system that is more patient-centered and consumer-based is that people ought to know whether or not the physicians that are treating them are in accordance with what they want in terms of their ethical, uh, their ethical uh, decisions. And it, it seems to me this is a no-brainer for conservatives, certainly, but libertarians as well, that we ought to have a situation where people are absolutely comfortable, uh, that they have trust, that their physicians share their values. I'll just give you one example. Can you imagine, for example, a young woman who is uh, pregnant is getting ready to have a baby and who ask her the question, well, how do you feel about an abortionist delivering your baby? 
I would say that probably the yuck factor for a lot of young women would be such that they would reject that idea. Uh, so people have strong feelings about these matters. Our job, it seems to me, is to promote freedom in this area and uh, give people an opportunity to uh, contract with those who they feel best reflect their own convictions in these matters. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative just because I want to follow up on Jonathan's question about trends. For two and a half millennia, um, the practice of medicine was governed by that Hippocratic commitment of not to kill and not to advise killing. And Far, you mentioned in your opening comments that we now have the best palliative medicine in all of human history. So why is it only now that we as a society think that doctors should assist in the killing of their patients? Um, wh what's going on that um, even with the best medicine possible, we think that now doctors uh, shouldn't just be in the healing business, but should be in both the healing or killing business, uh, depending on what request is demanded of them. I, I agree with Bob that it's, for two generations at least, there have been uh, some, the working out of some deep uh, cultural dynamics that have led uh, physicians to be construed increasingly as providers of services. And uh, there's a kind of growing cultural skepticism about whether there are any moral boundaries that can be maintained except the boundary against not giving someone what they choose. Um, and uh, I just want to highlight uh, the data uh, that make clear that it's not unrelieved symptoms that is driving the appeal for assisted suicide. If you look at the reports from uh, Oregon, for example, only one in four patients that has availed themselves of assisted suicide has reported even concern about future inadequate pain control. Many fewer reporting that they have inadequate pain control. And uh, on, uh, the, the fact is that nine out of 10 from these reports have requested assisted suicide because of concern about losing autonomy and being less able to engage in activities that make life enjoyable. Um, so what's happening is a, a kind of cultural insistence on control um, over the end of life uh, has, has uh, has led to the notion that the last thing that the patient ought to be able to control is how they die, and that therefore those around them, and specifically in this case their clinicians, have an obligation to go along with the plan that they that they have. I think that perhaps, you know, on behalf of those doctors who've been practicing for at least one generation, it may, it may be more than just the last two generations uh, in which we've seen this type of erosion. In fact, if you look back to about the time that medicine was becoming more scientific and therefore more effective, we also learned about things like genetics and, uh, and arose in that time an emphasis on eugenics, trying to just you know, make sure that everything is perfect in our patients. Uh, that, of course, found its worst case scenario in Germany prior to the National Socialist Party, where there were already strong arguments in favor of eliminating those who were weak and non-contributing uh, and less desirable in society. Well, because of the Second World War, I think there was a reaction to that, and there was kind of arrested that further development for a while. But, okay, here's, here's my generation's fault. In the 60s and the 70s, there became a uh, a whole new attitude towards society. We didn't trust those in authority. Uh, there was a, a skeptical attitude, and that reached medicine as well as the consumer society. So that you know, it's it was difficult in medicine not to trust anyone over thirty, but there certainly was an increased emphasis on autonomy, which persists into this day. That patients are insisting on their autonomy, uh, sometimes uh, exceeding the. Uh, and overpowering the physician's expertise as well as their, their own moral uh, status. So we'll go to Paul, Paul Larkin, and then we'll go over to, in the front row there. Uh, Paul Larkin, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, is pharmacology reached a state? Has it reached a state 
where any conceivable pain that someone could suffer can be alleviated? Or are there still instances of people suffering pain that no currently available drug can treat? I've practiced hospice and palliative medicine for 10 years. And I have never encountered a patient whose uh, distressing symptoms could not be relieved uh, using the technologies we have available, and particularly pharmacology. Um, it is the case that in um, a substantial proportion of those cases, we have as a side effect that the person loses consciousness, uh, they become sedated. Um, but that's a side effect that can often be reasonably accepted uh, when the pain is serious, and particularly when the person is close to the end of life. Uh, there are, I think in theory, um, uh, very rare cases of uh, pain that cannot be relieved without the side effect of sedation. But um, those are very rare cases. In all honesty, I think you should add, nevertheless, we hear reports from families, from others, about loved ones dying in pain. And I don't discount those entirely. I think there may be two good reasons for those reports persisting. One, many physicians do not have the same level of expertise as Dr. Uh, Curlin does. And we need to do a better job of palliative care in this country. Yep. You know, not everybody has the skills that they should have to relieve all the kind of pain. But the other problem is there are patients who will refuse that sort of pain relief because they don't want to be feeling obtunded or they don't want to even slip into an unconsciousness. And so they will say, no, I, I won't do that, but now I'm in pain. So between those two horns of the dilemma, we can still find a, uh, a way to treat the patients who are in pain satisfactorily if we take uh, steps to do so. Let me just build on that for a minute. Um, Paul's a legal scholar here at Heritage, and so Paul, I'm, I'm working from memory, but if I remember correctly, um, when Kennedy wrote the Glucksberg opinion, uh, which was on whether or not there's a constitutional right to assisted suicide, he pointed out that the European countries that had legalized assisted suicide um, also had some of the poorest uh, records and poorest financing of palliative care. Uh, so what Kevin's pointing out and saying, you know, we want uh, greater training in pal palliative care, greater expertise in palliative care, the trends seem to be cross-cutting, um, that as a society opts for assisted suicide and euthanasia, it actually directs uh, more attention and training and in funding towards those ends and away from pain management, palliative care, and hospice care. Uh, and if I remember correctly, that was cited in, in Glucksburg. Um, for what it's worth. Yep. Hello, I'm Bonnie Matheson. I have moved back to Washington recently to take care of my 101-year-old mother, <laughs> who is perfectly healthy, by the way, takes no medication, nothing wrong with her except her mind is going. But you all didn't mention the really most important thing, which is that doctors today can keep people alive, not my mother, because she's not sick, but uh, some of her ex-husbands, lovers, whatever. I've had some experience with this. Um, <laughs> that one uh, man that my mother did not marry after my father died, um, it, she had this relationship. And because she wasn't the wife, she had no power. And he was had had a stroke and was very, very ill. And the doctors, first of all, he was in ICU. They said, you've got to get him out of that. They'll never let him die. And then they... He was in a Catholic hospital, Catholic doctor. The doctor is saying, even though he had an eight-page living wheel, you know, that where does it say he doesn't want to sit in the wheelchair listening to the birds? But that was actually the exact reason he wrote the eight-page living wheel, because he didn't want that. Anyway, um, the man finally was, his son finally signed off on him. Mother didn't have the, the authority. But the nurse said to my mother and me, why are you keeping this man alive? And that, that was a very personal um, situation, but this happens a lot now. You can keep people alive who never would have lived. Even 50 years ago, they would have been dead. And so that's, that's where it becomes, okay, okay, you wanna keep them alive, keep them alive, but you can keep them alive really indefinitely sometimes. So 
I don't know. I don't. I don't have an answer to that. I, there's no question mark. Um, how, how do you tell the difference between when somebody wants to die and should have normally, but you all have kept them from dying? So that's the that's the question mark, I guess. Thank well, you. let me address that as a physician ethicist who actually works in a Catholic hospital. Uh, there were a couple of potential solutions to that problem that unfortunately don't sound like they were very effective in this particular case. Uh, you know, here's a patient who actually had an advanced directive. He had a living will. Okay, and I think that that's one of the problems with living wills is they are subject to interpretation. Uh, but he also had people who knew him and he trusted and should have been empowered to insist on what his values truly would have been if they didn't involve sitting in a wheelchair and listening to the birds. Uh, and when we get into that kind of conflict between physicians who are trying to do good for the patient, but the, their definition of the good doesn't necessarily match that of the patient or the family, this is a, an excellent opportunity for an ethics consultation the ethics consultations are available in most hospitals, and they actually are designed to help resolve those kinds of conflicts. And I would just add that um, under the, the uh, moral norms that have guided medicine for these many centuries, it is uh, in many cases uh, reasonable to stop um, life-sustaining technologies um, because one judges that they don't have sufficient prospect for benefit relative to the burdens that they're imposing. And my guess is in the case you're describing, it's not so much the problem that he's alive, it's the problem that he's being subjected to the burdens of, of treatment that's really does not offer him uh, sufficient benefit. Let's go, um, the two questions in the back row there. You can decide who goes first. And <laughs> this might be too broad a question, but I wondered if Dr. Donovan or Dr. Curlin had any general response to Dr. Moffitt's comments, um, just in general, uh, some of the things he stated. Anything in particular? I was just watching the dynamic, and it seemed like there was something that maybe I would love to hear <laughs> that may have been going through your minds. You guys have read Bob's paper. What did you think of it? Like, <laughs> um, the answer better be good. Uh, yeah, they, they, What's uh, good. Uh, answer? We went a good answer. Go. I, I will say I think the the term ethical in the title is is important. So um, it can't just be about choice because of course the it's it's not an accident that the advocacy organization for assisted suicide and euthanasia is compassion and choices. Um, it's not an accident that the California law legalizing assisted suicide was called the End of Life Options Act. And so um, I think it's going to be crucial to have policies that sustain the conditions in which those, particularly those who are sick, those who are disabled, those who are debilitated, those who, who because of their illness um, are in positions of relative vulnerability, um, can trust the medical profession. Um, and that means you have to have some boundaries. Um, and this ancient boundary has served us well, and it is at our peril that we give it up. My question is, you know, mo most of the conversation naturally with end of life deals with, with Medicare, with older people, with people who are chronically ill. Um, but what happens when the end of life comes early? So when you're dealing with a minor, how do we think about that and what are the trends on that? He's a pediatrician. <laughs> yes, that's the only reason they included me on the panel, I'm sure, because <laughs> of that question coming up. Uh, and, and there are some important similarities and some important differences when we see children who are critically ill and terminally ill. The uh, one very important thing there is in the decision-making, because the decision-making is rarely that of the child alone, although as a, uh, a minor becomes more mature and an adolescent and is close to legal adulthood, their own values and opinions become increasingly important. But the decision-makers up until that time 
are always the parents because we assume they know the child well and have their best interests at heart. Another important difference, of course, is that, uh, that we will often work a little harder to, to try and pull a kid through because they have so much of their life ahead of them. And whether, you know, you can argue whether that's the, the right thing to do or not uh, if you're an older patient, but, uh, but I think that there's a strong argument to be made there. And the last point I would make is that it is frightening to me as someone trained in pediatrics to realize that the same arguments that are being applied to older patients terminally ill at the end of life, we shouldn't let them suffer. We should either euthanize them or assist in their suicide, are being applied to children in other venues, not in the United States currently, but in other countries that have approved this. And in fact, they are going forward with this to the point where children are being euthanized who are far too young to think that this is anything good for them. And in, in some places are being euthanized not because they are suffering, but because it is feared that sometime in their future life they may suffer from whatever condition uh, they're being treated for. I'll just add to that that <clears throat> 1939, uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, the leader of the National Socialist uh, Movement in Germany, um, regularized uh, the euthanization, uh, the euthanizing of mentally deficient children, uh, large numbers. So this is a concern for children. Okay, we have time for one last question. So we're gonna go in the back corner. At Heiselmeyer Heritage Foundation, I was particularly taken, uh, Dr. Kerlin, with your observations about um, how this undermines patients' faith in the profession and ability to turn. And so I, the question for the panel is, um, it occurred to me that maybe a, a civil society solution, in addition to the public policy solution, would be to have an entity that accredits providers based on an ethical standard and uh, says, you know, basically based on the traditional Hippocratic Oath and puts the stamp of approval and audits them on providers, both physicians and institutions like hospitals, nursing homes, hospice care, et cetera, that adhere to that um, because the profession isn't doing it itself anymore. And in the state, you're going to have, it becomes a political conflict. But if you created this kind of organization that accredited, then whenever a bill comes up, like in California, well, if you force us to refer, we all lose our accreditation as ethical institutions. Um, any reaction to that? Uh, I agree that uh, that we have reached a point in time where uh, we are going to need that kind of self-conscious uh, medical reform association um, so that people have clarity about where their clinicians stand and about whether the hospital that, that uh, they are seeking to go to is hospitable to uh, physicians practicing according to these time-tested uh, convictions. Um, and there are some of us working on that uh, right now. Mm. So I uh, hope to have more news on that shortly. You would probably be comforted to know that there are some voluntary associations, not accrediting bodies, that already exist who share a common set of values, the ones that we've been discussing here today. Uh, the Christian Medical Dental Association, the Catholic Medical Association, and some like that, where patients, if they know their doctors belong to those associations, can be pretty sure of their values, just like in certain hospitals. We shall remain nameless currently. So with that, we're out of time. Um, we have copies of Bob's report outside. We also have sandwiches outside, so please help yourself to both. And please join me in thanking today's panel. <laughs>